The word of the Lord came to me. Take an offering from the exiles, from Heldai, Tobijah, and Jediah, who have arrived from Babylon, and go that same day to the house of Josiah, son of Zephaniah. Take silver and gold, make a crown, and place it on the head of Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. You are to tell him, this is what the Lord of armies says, Here is a man whose name is Branch. He will branch out from his place and build the Lord's temple. Yes, he will build the Lord's temple. He will bear royal splendor and will sit on his throne and rule. There will be a priest on his throne, and there will be peaceful counsel between the two of them. The crown will reside in the Lord's temple as a memorial to Heldai, Tobijah, Jediah, and Hain, son of Zephaniah. People who are far off will come and build the Lord's temple. And you will know that the Lord of armies has sent me to you. This will happen when you fully obey the Lord your God. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we do praise you that today our Savior, the Lord Jesus, rose from the grave. And that now as we bow before you, he sits on the throne, your throne of glory and grace, our great priest king a full and sufficient Redeemer, building the temple of the Lord, the church of the living God, where he will make his spirit dwell from people from all over the world. We thank you that he does that as the gospel is preached. And so we pray that as your word is opened and proclaimed, that our King and God and Redeemer and Lord and Friend and Savior, the Lord Jesus, would build his temple and his kingdom even here among us. For the glory of his name we pray. Amen. It is the constant contemplation of the glory of God, wrote the Puritan John Owen. That is one of the greatest privileges and advantages of believers both in this world and unto eternity. Another has said that the personal glory of the Lord Jesus is to the Bible what the sun is to our planet, that what the church of God requires collectively and needs individually is a frequent repose and devout meditation within the hollow temple of the Redeemer's glory. The more closely we contemplate it, And the more transforming and assimilating its influence upon our minds, the better we shall be fitted and the more successful will be our labors to go forth and invite others to its study and win them to its love. For much of the first six chapters of this amazing book of prophecy, we've seen a series of eight night visions that were given to the prophet Zechariah. And now, at the end of chapter six, we come not to yet another vision given to Zechariah, but to an action that he was commanded to take in the light of those visions. And it was an action that was not only made meaningful by the eight visions that preceded it, but that also signified the great event to which all those preceding visions were pointing. All the preceding visions spoke in various ways of God's devoted love for his people, to his commitment to keep all the promises that he made to them. And the most immediate and final vision, verses 1 through 8 of chapter 6, were told symbolically of the judgment that God will bring upon the ungodly nations of the world that have set themselves against his kingdom. And now, after all the visions have been given, Zechariah is commanded to symbolize the coronation of the king who will rule that kingdom. Concerning this great passage, Charles Feinberg wrote, Here we have the end and consummation of all prophetic scriptures, the crowning of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is only after the dark night of world judgment and punishment is past that the glorious light of Christ's coronation day will follow. This is one of the sublimest passages in the scriptures on the person and work of the Messiah. In other words, Zechariah's visions encouraged God's people that the temple would be rebuilt in Jerusalem. But important as the temple was, it was not the source of Israel's hope. Far more important is the man who comes to build the true temple. God lifts Israel's eyes from the temple building to the temple builder, there to rest their hope. And so acting on God's behalf, Zechariah placed a crown on the head of the high priest, and then with a finger pointing at the one who symbolically represented another, the prophet cried, here is a man. It's my prayer this morning that we will see that prophesied man and be changed into his likeness. 
And so as we look at this passage, here's the key truth that I want us to believe. The crown priest will build the Lord's temple. So come and help build it. But how would the prophet teach us about this crown priest? And what does it mean for him to build the Lord's temple? That's what I want us to see this morning. So if you're not there already, turn to Zechariah 6. The passage begins with a sign act in the crowning of Joshua the high priest. And then Zechariah speaks an oracle about the branch whom Joshua symbolizes. And then he makes application to the people in Zechariah's day and those yet to come. So I want us to observe three scenes in our passage today. The priest's coronation, verses 9 through 11. The prophet's declaration, verses 12 to 13. And the people's participation, in verses 14 through 15. Let's look with me at the priest's coronation, verses 9 through 11. The word of the Lord came to me. Take an offering from the exiles, from Heldai, Tobijah, and Jediah, who have arrived from Babylon, and go that same day to the house of Josiah, son of Zephaniah. Take silver and gold, make a crown, and place it on the head of Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Now, that this is not another one of the night visions is shown by the phrase, the word of the Lord came to me. Uh, This distinguishes what follows from the other introductory statements that pointed to another vision in the sequence of visions. You might recall some of those, right? I looked out in the night. I, I looked up and saw. Then he showed me, and so forth. So this is not presented as a vision, but rather as a distinct command. But it has a close relationship to the eight and nine visions, as shown by the reappearance of Joshua, whom we saw in chapter 3, and the same focus on the temple. Now the action that's commanded has to do with the reception of a gift of gold and silver brought by exiles who had arrived from Babylon. Merrill Unger notes the God-honoring names of this three-man crew, and it may be that their names are meant to be seen as symbolically significant. You have Heldai, whose name means the Lord's world. His alternate name in verse 14 in some translations is Helem. Then you have Tobijah, whose name means Yahweh is good. And Jediah, whose name means Yahweh knows. And so they come to Jerusalem as exiles. That means as, as Jews who had been in captivity in Babylon with a donation from their fellow exiles for the work of rebuilding the temple. And their names may suggest their personal piety and their worthiness to be entrusted with such a responsibility. Now it's important that this gift is brought to Zechariah, since he had received the eight important night visions. Now, we don't know their motive for coming. It's not stated. Whatever motive they had for this offering, the Lord uses it to symbolize something of great significance through his prophet. And so now, the same day that he received it, Zechariah is to take the gift and is to enter the house of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah, with it. The name Josiah means the Lord supports, and his other name, Hain, given in verse 14, means gracious. And these names may suggest that this man, Josiah, is a host to the three men who had come from Babylon. But by verse 14, he's considered one of the others who would now bear witness to the significant thing that is about to occur. And Zechariah is to make a crown from the silver and gold. The original Hebrew has the word for crown in the plural, crowns. But it's best to see it as describing a a composite crown made from several parts, perhaps part of silver and part of gold, woven together into one elaborate crown. So that's what some of your translations might say, an ornate crown, an elaborate crown. And this reminds us of the crown that Lord Jesus will wear at the time of his return, where many crowns will be on his head. And Zechariah is told to then take this elaborate crown and set it not on the head of the governor Zerubbabel, which would have communicated the restoration then and there of kingship from David's line. It would not have done justice to the great thing that God was about to communicate. But to set it rather on the head of the high priest Joshua, the son of Jehozadak. You recall that it was the high priest Joshua and not the governor Zerubbabel who was identified symbolically as my servant, the branch, in chapter 3, verse 8. And so this coronation symbolically communicates the promised union of the offices of priest and king under one person, as we'll see in verses 12 to 13. And so it's a remarkably clear picture of the promised ministry of our Savior. And so that's the sign act, the priest's coronation. Now let's consider Zechariah's words to Joshua, the prophet's 
declaration. And we'll spend most of our time here. Look with me at verse 12. You are to tell him, this is what the Lord of armies says. Here is a man whose name is Branch. He will branch out from his place and build the Lord's temple. Yes, he will build the Lord's temple. He will bear royal splendor and will sit on his throne and rule. There will be a priest on his throne, and there will be peaceful counsel between the two of them. So Zechariah has provided the picture in crowning Joshua. Now with a word from the Lord, he speaks of its significance. In densely packed statements, we have arguably the most complete depiction of Christ in the Old Testament. Zechariah gives eight descriptions of the one whom Joshua represents. Consider first his design. Here is a man. These are words that echo throughout the Bible as the core of God's message for the salvation of sinners. Here is a man. First, he was known simply as the offspring of the first woman, Eve. To Satan in the garden, God has spoken of him, I will put hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. Here's a man, we hear. And the first thing we know about him is that he will be a man, truly man, and the son of a human mother. Later, God identifies him as the offspring of Abraham, a descendant of the man of faith. The generations pass, and in the day of Moses, God said once more, Here is a man. This time he is a prophet, one like Moses, who would speak from God to the people. God said, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. I will put my words in his mouth, and he will tell them everything I command him. Later still, David is shown a king to sit on his throne forever, one of his own descendants. Here is a man, God says to our faith. In Isaiah 53, he is the suffering servant, the man of sorrows. Yet he himself bore our sicknesses, and he carried our pains. But we, in turn, regarded him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. And here in Zechariah, we have reached the Old Testament's most complete portrait of this long-awaited man. A crown is placed on the high priest's head to go with the garments of righteousness he received in chapter 3. Here is a man, says the Lord. This is the man who will sit enthroned, robed in majesty, to build the spiritual house that will be God's true temple. How many Jews in Zechariah's day looked ahead to this man in faith? They wondered when he would appear, what he would look like. Their hearts burned to see the day when this man would be unveiled. That day did come at last, when the man was presented before the crowds of Jerusalem. And just as Zechariah had placed a crown of woven strands upon the head of Joshua, so a crown was placed on the brow of God's true man. A purple robe was draped around his shoulders. And with words echoing God's earlier revelation, the cry was lifted to the assembled crowd, Here is the man. It was just as Zechariah had prefigured. And yet, so very different. Jesus Christ was crowned not with woven silver and gold, but with a crown of thorns. The purple robe was given not to honor him, but to mock him. John tells us, Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the temple servants saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! Was this the plan for the man all along? Scripture says, There is one God, and one mediator between God and mankind, the man, Christ Jesus. A mediator was needed. It was God who was offended, and it was God who satisfied, said the Puritan Watson. To which we would add, it was man who offended, and it was man who must answer for the offense. Both are necessary. For our redemption, there was required a perfect obedience and a perfect payment or satisfaction, each having infinite value to answer for a world of sinners. And Christ's deity answers the demands of an infinite obedience and an infinite payment. His humanity answers the demands of a human substitution and a human satisfaction. Consider this. Christ took up our flesh that he might render for us what we owe to God in terms of obedience. 
Consider this also. He took up our flesh that he might die in it for us, what we owed to God in terms of disobedience. The goal of Bethlehem was always Golgotha. The whole point of the birth of this blessed man was not sentimental, but sacrificial. The body prepared for him was prepared to be one sacrifice for sins for all time. The humanity he willingly and lovingly assumed was assumed that he might assume our sin, be made sin for us, absorb absorb our guilt, and in our place assuage the holy and righteous wrath of Almighty God against sin. He took a body that he might take the blows due to sinners. Here's why the fruit of Mary's womb was so blessed. Had Christ not been made flesh, then we would forever have been made cursed. Had he not been incarnated, then we would have been incarcerated and incinerated forever. And so when we see the fulfillment of what the prophet prefigured, we are not disappointed, but held in reverent awe. The prophet wove a crown of silver and gold, but how much more precious is the crown of thorns? Oh, that we would see more beauty there than in all the silver and gold this world has to offer. Here is the man. Here is the answer long awaited. And God raised him up that all might look on him, believe, and be saved. Thirty years after his resurrection and ascension into heaven, Paul still calls him in 1 Timothy 2.5, the man, Christ Jesus. In Acts 17, as Paul exhorts the men in Athens to repent, he tells them of God's appointed day of judgment, by the man he has appointed. And it is to Christ as God, yet holding on to a glorified humanity, that we look. Our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly wait for a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humble condition into the likeness of His glorious body, by the power that enables Him to subject everything to Himself. You mean likeness to Him as God's, as Mormonism teaches? No, like Him as He is man, whose humanity has been glorified. He remains our pattern in heaven and for eternity. Brothers and sisters, are you looking to Christ? It's by looking at this man that we are made like him. We all, with unveiled faces, are looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord and are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. Look to Christ. Consider, second, his designation, whose name is Branch. Branch is a title for a descendant of King David who would be the coming Messiah. The prophet Isaiah spoke of the days when there would be a shoot that would grow from the stump of Jesse, David's family, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. So a remnant from King David's family, a branch, will come restoring the royal line. Or listen to the prophet Jeremiah in words spoken just before the exile. Look, the days are coming. When I will raise up a righteous branch for David, he will reign wisely as king and administer justice and righteousness in the land. You can almost hear a collective sigh of relief from the men in Josiah's living room. Because when they hear that the branch is the one for whom the crown is intended, they understand this isn't really about Joshua, the high priest. After all, Joshua is not of the tribe of Judah. He's not a son of David. Someone else is in view. And yet, in the fullness of time, even Joshua, in his name, prefigures the branch. And in Hebrew, it is Yehoshua. In Greek, it is Yesu. It means Yahweh is salvation. And when the angel appeared to Joseph, announcing the birth of Christ, he told him, you are to name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. The writer of Hebrews tells us that after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, So he became superior to the angels, just as the name he inherited is more excellent than theirs. Because Jesus humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee will bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Consider third, his development. He will branch out from his place. Zechariah tells us why his name is Branch. He will branch out from his place. Isaiah 53 verse 2 says, He grew up before him like a young plant, 
and like a root out of dry ground. He didn't have an impressive form or majesty that we should look at him. No appearance that we should desire him. The prophets emphasize the fact that Jesus began in lowly, insignificant circumstances. The line of David had seemingly been toppled. No king from David's line had sat on the throne of Israel for over 600 years. The tree stump looked lifeless. But then an insignificant young woman gave birth in a stable in the city of David to the branch of David. And he sprouted into a mighty tree whose branches reach to the ends of the earth. And he is coming as the king to consummate his kingdom and his glory will cover the whole earth. He will branch out from his place. Consider fourth his duty. He will build the Lord's temple. In the ancient world, temple building was the work of kings. King Solomon built the first temple. And the temple was God's dwelling place among men. His his glory was revealed in the temple. The objects in the temple and its design reflected God's character and the way in which his people must approach him. The temple was the closest thing on earth where people could see the Lord. And now you may recall that in chapter 4, verse 9, the Lord promised that Zerubbabel, whose hands laid the foundation of the rebuilt temple, would also complete it. And yet, two times in this text, the Lord says through Zechariah that, yes, he, the branch, will build the Lord's temple. And so this points to the future, (laughs) which in the media context means that the temple in question could not be the second temple built by Zerubbabel and the returned exiles. The temple they built was temporary, a symbol of a greater temple built by a greater temple builder. And whoever the branch would be, he would have to build a temple not yet standing in Zechariah's day. And brothers and sisters, we have the full story. This is a promise that Jesus will come and build a temple made from the lives of sinners for whom he shed his blood. Jesus is building a temple for God in which he dwells by his spirit, a place where he is worshipped. And he is building it, constructing it from the lives of men and women, boys and girls, who are brought into his church through faith in his gospel. And all of this he accomplishes by means of this cross. Jesus would say to his opponents in John 2, verse 19, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it up in three days. The Jews who were listening said, This temple took 46 years to build, and will you raise it up in three days? But this is John's comment now. But he was speaking about the temple of his body. So like the temple of Solomon, destroyed by the Babylonians before the exile, the temple of Jesus' body was destroyed at the cross. And the ruined temple of Zechariah's day likewise had to be rebuilt. But it was only a shadow of the true temple Jesus' resurrection would provide. In three days, the true temple where God and sinners might meet in fellowship forever was rebuilt. When Jesus rose in victory and triumph over the grave, In the temple Jesus builds, the center in which God may now be known among his people, is constructed by means of the work of Jesus Christ, crucified and risen from the dead. And so the Lord Jesus is the greater temple builder. And the amazing thing is that we are now the temple of the living God. 2 Corinthians 6, verse 16, We are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will dwell and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. As you come to Jesus, Peter says, 1 Peter 2, verse 5, you yourselves, as living stones, a spiritual house, are being built to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Or as Paul puts it, the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole building being put together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you are also being built together for God's dwelling in the Spirit. Brothers and sisters, if we see the incredible importance of the church and God's plan, we will commit ourselves to seeing it built for his glory. Jesus promised, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Christ's temple, the church, will never be destroyed. As the God-man, Jesus 
is the divine temple builder who is building his church into a holy temple, a clean sanctuary that will endure forever. Are you part of this temple by faith in him? Have you identified with Christ in his church through baptism and covenanting, formally identifying with a local church through membership? You know, membership in a local church is how we make visible our membership in Christ's universal church. And it's a, it's a concrete way for the world to know we're a living stone in the temple that Christ is building. Consider fifth, his dignity. He will bear royal splendor. He will not only accomplish the temple building task, but he will be marked by regal majesty and splendor. Solomon's glory took the queen of Sheba's breath away. His wisdom, his prosperity far surpassed all the reports she had received. And yet Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like the Lord Jesus. He is, as the hymn says, fairest Lord Jesus. Paul says in 1 Timothy 3.16, Most certainly the mystery of godliness is great. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. Well, what is this present glory? As his resurrection was the means to his ascension, so his ascension, in turn, was a means to his climactic exaltation and enthronement at the Father's right hand as Holy One, Lord, Christ, Prince, and Savior of the world. If his ascension was in glory, exalting him thereby higher than all the heavens, he is also now crowned with glory and honor, with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him, with everything under his feet, the Father alone accepted, sitting far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. God has also given him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way, indeed, who fills the whole universe with his power and lordship. In sum, he now occupies the highest place of glory and honor, which the heaven can afford, and him belongs the titles Lord of all, and Lord above all other lords. And the nature of his lordship entitles him sovereignly to bestow gifts of every and whatever kind upon men as he pleases. That's his present glory. And so we sing, Thee will I cherish, thee will I honor, thou, my soul's glory, joy, and crown. Six, consider his dominion. And will sit on his throne and rule this is what the branch will do. He will preside over his kingdom and govern and defend his people. He will fulfill Isaiah 9, verse 7. The dominion will be vast and his prosperity will never end. He will reign on the throne of David and over of his kingdom to establish and sustain it with justice and righteousness from now on and forever. The zeal of the Lord of armies will accomplish this. Friends, tens of thousands died for Napoleon. Napoleon died for no one. Millions died for Hitler and Stalin and Chairman Mao and Saddam Hussein. They died for nobody. Even leaders in relatively free nations require people to die under their rule. Some are still dying in this troubled world under human rulership. But Jesus is the one ruler who dies for his people, for those he rules. And he frees his subjects from a tyranny that's far worse than any political tyranny. And that's why we willingly obey him. While we want nothing to do that displeases him, say nothing that dishonors him, and live only to his glory and praise. What is his labor in glory? Oh, beloved of God, here again we must bow in humble awe and adoration. Having left us and been raised to the highest place, he does not forget us. Though he announced with respect to his atoning work, it is finished. He is not finished for us. Having sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, he is not idle. John Owen wrote, he leads not in heaven a life of mere glory, majesty, and blessedness, but a life of office, love, and care also. He is a king in glory. And he is exalted to reign and rule, a king now coronated and throned above. 
In Ephesians 1, 20-23, says that God exercised this power in Christ by raising him from the dead and seating him at his right hand in the heavens, far above every ruler and authority, power and dominion, and every title given, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he subjected everything under his feet and appointed him as head over everything for the church. He is exalted to subdue his enemies. 1 Corinthians says he must reign until he puts all his enemies under his feet. And he is exalted as king to rule over and preserve his church. Here is the exalted glory of the Lord to rule over and preserve his church, unleashing, directing, judging, pardoning, rewarding, protecting, and building with all of his privilege and power, his beautiful temple. Consider seventh, his dual office. There will be a priest on his throne. This is a stunning statement. Why is that? Because in God's economy, the offices of king and priest were distinct. There was a separation of powers. A priest served as the mediator between holy God and sinful men. He had to be one with the people so as to identify with them. But he also had to be separate from the people in holiness so that he could approach God on their behalf. Now, on the other hand, the king represented God to the people. He mediated God's rule over the people. And furthermore, the priests came from the tribe of Levi, whereas the king had to be a descendant of David from the tribe of Judah. And so this was an unthinkable concept previously in Israel. Priests did not sit on thrones, and kings did not serve as priests. And to try to combine these offices spelled trouble. Two times in Israel's history, a king tried to take the prerogative of a priest and was punished. In 1 Samuel 13, King Saul took it upon himself to offer the burnt offerings in Samuel's absence, and God vowed to remove him from office. In 2 Chronicles 26, proud King Uzziah took up a censer to offer incense as a priest, and leprosy broke out on his forehead, and he was a leper the rest of his life. And yet, there were hints that one day these two offices would be joined together. Psalm 110 speaks of a Davidic king who would be a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And here, Zechariah says, there will be a priest on his throne. Well, that seems to speak of two persons, doesn't it? But it's also grammatically possible, and some translations do this, translate it, he will be a priest on his throne. So that the two offices would be united in one person. And so the branch is different from those before him. He rules as both king and he serves as high priest. The book of Hebrews speaks of how the Lord Jesus fulfills this prophecy. And in almost a perfect commentary on our passage, Hebrews 8 verse 1 says of Christ, we have this kind of priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. The priests of Aaron's order never sat down. There were no chairs in the tabernacle or temple because their work was never done. They had to offer sacrifices for their own sins as well as for the sins of the people. But this man, after offering one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God, and he is now waiting until his enemies are made his footstool. We need a priest to clean us up, to justify us, and save us. We need a king to subdue us because we are rebels, and we need him to defeat our enemies. And only in the Lord Jesus Christ do we get both. Brothers and sisters, there is a glorious God on the throne, and therefore we have a certain confidence. There is a glorious king on the throne, Therefore, we have a certain security and stability. There is a glorious priest on the throne. Therefore, we have a certain sympathy and representation. And there is a glorious man on the throne. Therefore, we have a certain salvation and hope. Consider eighth, his diplomacy. And there will be peaceful counsel between the two of them. The branch, the Davidic king, will sit on his throne and rule. And yet on that throne will sit a priest. And between these two ministries, the priestly 
and the keenly, there will be perfect harmony and agreement. And that's why I think there was a double crown, a ring of gold and a ring of silver resting on Joshua's brow. In the one crown, just as there would be in this one man who was to come, the office of priest and the office of king will combine. It's a dramatic picture of one who was still to come and who would be in one person, both a priest and a king. He will rule on the throne and have royal dignity. He will build the temple and he will do all of it, not by force of arms, nor by political machinations, but he will do it in the office of a priest. And through this keen priest, there will be peaceful counsel between the two of them. There is some debate about what them refers to, but it likely refers to the reconciling of the two offices in the Lord Jesus Christ. There could be no tug of war between the political and religious spheres, because in Jesus, both offices will reside in one person, the Prince of Peace. Friends, you will not know true peace with God unless Jesus is both your high priest and your king. You need a priest to deal with your guilt before God. And Jesus offered himself as the perfect sacrifice. And if you have put your trust in him alone for forgiveness, that sacrifice applies to all of your sins. But Jesus also must be your king. To accept him as your high priest, who opened the way into God's presence, but not to obey him as your king, is unthinkable. You cannot eliminate either office of Christ. He is both priest and king. And therefore, he deserves all the honor, all the glory, all the praise, all our trust, all our obedience, all our love. So we've seen the priest's coronation and the prophet's declaration. Now we see the people's participation. Look at verse 14. The crown will reside in the Lord's temple as a memorial to Heldai, Tobijah, Jediah, and Hain, son of Zephaniah. People who are far off will come and build the Lord's temple, and you will know that the Lord of armies has sent me to you. This will happen when you fully obey the Lord your God. So the picture and the prophecy have been given, and now Zechariah gives four ways for God's people to participate in the work of the crown priest. First way, remember God's promise. Verse 14. The crown, the symbol of the union of the two offices and this one man, did not remain on the head of Joshua the high priest, nor did it become his possession. After all, Joshua was only a man, not the man. No, the crown is to be lodged, Zechariah says, in the second temple. And there it would serve as a reminder to Halem, Tobijah, to die in Hain, the same men mentioned in verse 10, the three exiles and Josiah, that their savior, the priest king, was coming. It would remind them that the one this crown belongs to is coming soon. So brothers and sisters, remember God's promise. We now live on the other side of this prophecy. The crown priest arrived in Jesus of Nazareth. He has inaugurated his reign as king, and he represents us as a priest. And yet his work is still ongoing. Christ is still building his church, and we still labor in the Lord for his glory. Remember God's determination to act in the days still to come. God has also given us signs to remember. Every time we celebrate the Lord's Supper, as often as we eat the bread and drink the cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And even as we remember what God has done through Christ in the past, we remember his promises for the future. So let's be forward-looking people. One day Christ will come and his temple will be complete. We'll hear a loud voice from the throne saying, Look! God's dwelling is with humanity, and he will live with them. They will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them, and will be their God. Church, remember God's promise. Second, build God's people. Look at verse 15. People who are far off will come and build the Lord's temple. That language, people who are far off, becomes code for Gentiles, non-Jews. Peter uses it in his great Pentecost sermon 
In Acts 2.39, repent, he says, as he proclaims the cross and the resurrection of Christ. Repent and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children, and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. Jews and Gentiles alike, gather together into the kingdom of Christ. And the really stunning thing is that those who are far off, who have been gathered into the kingdom, get to participate in the work of temple building. Those whom Jesus saves and makes his own, they don't just become passengers along for the ride, passively watching as Jesus builds his church. No, we get to share in the work of temple building. We get to become his agents in bringing the good news to the world that there is a king in heaven, a priest who can deal with your sin and reconcile you to God, Jesus Christ, the righteous branch. We get to share in the gathering of living stones that they might be built upon the chief cornerstone that is the Lord Jesus. If you've become, as it were, a brick in the temple that Jesus is building through faith in him, you have work to do as well. Those who are far off shall come and build the temple of the Lord. There are men and women, boys and girls in this county, in this city, who don't know Jesus. They don't know him. And they're headed for a lost eternity. And the call of this passage is to go tell them of Christ, to bring them like stones from the quarry to the master builder who will shape and form them and build them into the temple that is his church. We get to participate with Jesus in his temple building project. What we so often shrink from as an intimidating thing, Zacharias sees as an immense privilege. The branch himself, the priest king, the Lord Jesus Christ, is building his church. And he turns to you today, if you're a Christian, and holds out his hand, as it were, and invites you to join him in the work. What a privilege. Friend, maybe you're here this morning, and you're, you're near to God's word, but you're far away from God. Friend, this is an invitation to you. You can be the fulfillment of this prophecy you who are far off can be brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ. Don't leave this place without drawing near to God through faith in his Son. Today can be the day of your salvation. And so this verse points us to the great missionary task of the church. God's plan is for all peoples to worship. We are to be a light unto all the nations so that someday there will be a vast multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and language which no one can number, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. What a glorious day that will be. Third, believe God's prophet. Look at the second half of verse 15. And you will know, Zechariah says, that the Lord of armies has sent me to you. When the branch comes and the people from far off join him in the temple building work, taking the gospel to the nations, it will be the great confirmation that Zechariah has in fact been the spokesman for the Lord himself. The very mouthpiece of the Lord of armies. The authentication of the prophet, and by extend, extension the authentication of all scripture, lies in the coming of the person and in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then you will know when the branch comes and the temple arises and he builds his church and the gospel begins to span the globe, then you will know that he has sent me to you and that this word is true. Friends, it all points to Jesus. Jesus said to the scribes, remember, you pour over the scriptures because you think that you have eternal life in them and yet they testify about me. The scriptures find their authentication and fulfillment. In Jesus, the one of whom they speak with a uniform voice on every page, has come and done exactly as the Lord promised through his prophet. Believe God's prophet that Jesus Christ is the great demonstration of the unshakable reliability of the word of God. And then finally, obey God's precepts. Notice in verse 15, a call to obey. This will happen when you fully obey the Lord your God. This does not mean that Christ's coming and the Gentiles' participation in the kingdom were contingent, absolutely, 
on Israel's obedience. God's sovereign purpose does not depend on sinful, fickle man. What he means is that Israel will not come to the knowledge of the Messiah or his kingdom blessings unless they obeyed him fully. And still today, God's prophetic plan for the ages will come according to his sovereign timetable. But we will not be blessed as part of that plan unless we give ourselves fully to obey the Lord. God accomplishes his plans as his people take up his call to faithful service. The temple the branch is building is built as those who are far off come and participate in the work. The kingdom of God grows and the reign of Christ extends when his servants do what they're told and live as they're commanded. Gospel progress in the world and gospel purity in the church are joined together. It matters that you obey the Lord. That's a sobering truth, isn't it? Some well-meaning folks say, it's all about the mission. It's also about our maturity. We proclaim him, warning and teaching everyone that we may present everyone mature in Christ. The Great Commission is to make disciples of all nations and to teach them to obey everything Christ commanded. The faithfulness of our witness and the holiness of our lives, they're bound together. God doesn't commonly work with filthy instruments when he's performing saving surgery in a sinner's heart. He likes to make use of clean instruments when he saves. So are you a clean instrument ready for the master's use? All of this will come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God. Do you diligently obey the Lord? Or are you casual about his commands? The priest king has come, so I can sin. I'm covered by the blood. Really? Fully, diligently obey the Lord. Because the priest king has come, and because you're covered by his blood, and because he summons you to the high privilege of his service. So friends, brothers and sisters, Jesus, the crown priest, will build the Lord's temple. So come and help build it. That's what he wants for you. He gave his life to include you in his temple. He died to make you his. Which command of his asks too much of you that you will not fully obey in light of all that he's done for you? Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a present far too small. Love, so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. All my life, all of it, given in glad and joyful surrender for the use of King Jesus. Oh, that that might be our prayer and our song and the true commitment of our hearts. As we see again our Savior, the priest king, who has given himself to make us his, and build his temple, and call us into his service, for our joy and for his glory. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you that you have graciously redeemed us to be building blocks in the hands of the great temple builder, your son, our Lord Jesus. Help us, Father, to live in the realization that we are part of the work that Jesus is fashioning as the eternal temple builder. And we thank you that as priest and as sacrifice, he has saved us. And as king, he is our Lord and our master. May we be willing subjects of his gracious mastery to the glory of your name. Father, if there are any here who remain far off from you, may this moment right now be the time when you draw them to yourself in mercy. May they leave everything behind and come to Christ. May they join us as living stones in this great work of building your temple, Christ's precious church. We ask this in his great and glorious name. Amen.